Aloha, welcome to Think Tech. I'm Dean Sensui. I'm be your, I'll be your host today. I'm sitting in for Jay Fidel. Uh, today's show is uh, Fishing for Good Policy. We're going to be discussing the expansion of the, or proposed expansion of, of the Papahanao Mokuakea Monument up in the uh, northwestern Hawaiian Islands. And today's guest we have uh, Peter Apo. He's a trustee with the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. Uh, Makani Christensen, he's the owner of uh, Keawe Adventures, um, and he is the executive director of the Hunting, Fishing, and Farming Association. And Senator Brickwood Galateria, representing District District 12, including Waikiki, Ala Moana, Kaka'ako, Makali, and Mo'ili'ili. Oh, wow. Welcome. Thank, Thank you for being here. Um, yeah, we're going to be um, seven Hawaii, well, to put it shortly, um, there were seven people who proposed the expansion of the um, uh, Papa Hanau Mokuakea Monument, and um, if you can bring that graphic up, um, it shows, um, right now it's an area that's about 50 miles wide, it's in the light pink area uh, that you can see on the map. Um, it's about 100 miles wide and about 1,200 miles long, and what they want to do is they want to expand it to 400 miles wide, and it'll probably end up being about 1,400 miles long, which is about the size of Oregon, Washington, and California combined. In fact, it would cover that entire area. I um, uh, want to have um, talked to Peter about this. Um, so these seven Hawaiians wrote to President Obama to, expo yes. uh, to expand the monument. Um, and there's a lot of people who are looking at it as, initiative, as an initiative from Native Hawaiians. Um, why would they do this when it, it seems like you know, there's a lot of um, concern over the U.S. having taken Hawaii legally, and yet now they want to give away this huge chunk of ocean. Uh, exactly. I, I, I don't quite understand. Uh, I don't quite understand that reach. The first of all, I, I don't believe that the that the concept, uh, the conservation concept, is uh, is Hawaiian. Uh, Hawaiians. The, the the principle with marine conservation is the less humans, the better, and the less activity, the better. So it's about shutting out humanity. Now. Uh, you know, I am a supporter of certain kinds of conservation issues, but Hawaiians never shut humans out completely. We had very strict rules. We were species specific as to what got kapu. It was usually for a six month period. And, uh, and, 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 and so it was a rotating. It was never shutting humans out of, out of the environment because that was part of the food security. And during the kapu season, to ease the burden on people, you know, on if the, in case there was shortage, that's why we built fish ponds. The fish ponds were meant to offset the kapu uh, season. So the idea of closing out humanity to, in this case, 580,000 square miles of Hawaiian Ocean, and like you say, you know, my calculation was it's the size of Texas and uh, California and Montana uh, combined. And, and lastly, I don't want to take up all the conversation, it's the instrument by which this public policy would be enacted on the expansion. It simply requires the signature of the president on a, on a declaration that comes under uh, a, 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 an act that was enacted in 1906 called the Antiquities Act. It does not require any vetting through the Congress, uh, through the state, and especially th no vetting required for the people who live in the impacted area. So I have a real problem with just the way a monument, particularly of this size, you know, gets to. In, in other words, we have, a, um, we have a resource that thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people depend on. Yes. And, and yet, there's a small number of people who might dictate the policy of its access. They have and they can, yes. Okay. Uh, um, Makani, real quickly, um, let's see. You, you're the um, executive director of the Hunting, Farming, and Fishing Association. Um, how did that get started? Why, why did you start that up? You know, I saw commonalities between the different um, user groups or individuals that use the resources around the state. And I found that communication was uh, an issue that, because we're separated by islands, we weren't being able to communicate on the issues that happen at legislation. And a lot of times, farmers, fishermen, and hunters would have to um, figure out that something was happening to their farm, their, uh, the rules and regulations that came forth without them being aware of it. So what we did is we created a hunting, farming, fishing association and increased communication and just brought a big community together. I mean, 
from Hawaii Island to Kauai. So it was, uh, it, we've done a lot and it's, it's paid off through legislative process this year. So the HFFA's um, uh, primary focus is about food, right? It, it the, is. The motto is, we feed Hawaii. That's correct. Yeah, so since with something like this expansion, um, how do you think it might affect so food supply? It, the food supply, for example, if a lot of us like poke, we like sashimi, prices will go up. People will lose jobs and in essence, we'll lose a food source and we'll basically give it up to uh, foreign fleets, which who are not regulated to come into this area and sell it back to us at an increased price. I, I think I, I remember hearing somebody saying, it was Baron Miho at the United Fishing Agency saying that when that happens, it's almost like somebody stealing from you and selling it back to you. Yeah. Something like that. And you know, that's something that we should protect as far as Hawaii is concerned. Um, it's a resource, you know, we take about 1.5% of the fish resources in the, throughout the Pacific compared to all the foreign fleets. So it's not a big percentage and we're the most regulated industry in almost the entire world. We, we have a graphic that shows uh, how much um, the uh, U.S. actually takes um, from that resource. Uh, there's a chart and um, you can see on the right, the USA is actually Hawaii's fishing fleet and wow. it accounts for about 1.6, less than 2% of the total take of Big Eye in the Pacific and you can see how much the other, the other countries are taking. So when they're saying they want to put limits on what um, Hawaii is harvesting, it, does that help the resource no. realistically? No, what, what happens is it just allows foreign fleets to come in unregulated because you got to figure how is the U.S. going to regulate the foreign fishers to come into an area the size of California, Oregon, and Washington? I mean, it's almost impossible unless you, unless you have a lot of a lot of funding behind it. It's we're just basically shooting ourselves in the foot. So. Senator Galateria, mm -hmm. um, uh, what's the uh, Senate's stance on on this on this issue? Um, you have a kind of a pulse on that. Well, thank you for inviting me today. Oh, Certainly, I know what one senator's take is on it. I can share that with you. What my colleagues feel, I'll reserve them the time to explain but uh, I think your uh, the title of this show is very telling especially for me you know fishing for good policy as a policy maker we're always trying to ensure the best for all parties as best as you can so those seven friends they're friends of ours Peter and I we, we know the the gentleman who who uh, you know created and, and moved the initiative forward to the president's desk there's a time limit on it, so there's some urgency going on on both, par on both sides, both proponents and opponents. I think from, from our perspective, straight up, is it good policy? From a Native Hawaiian perspective, is this a Native Hawaiian issue? Because I think from the very get-go, the word Native Hawaiian and expansion don't go together. And, 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 That's to how be, we, and to be clear, all three of you are Native Hawaiians. Uh, to be clear, yes. uh, and we all probably come from different places on that too. But from, uh, you know, expansion is how we lost Hawaii. So we want to go back to the very source of it all. And that kind of rubs some of us in the wrong way. Mm -hmm. So although I'm a proud American and a very proud Native Hawaiian, and uh, also involved in the new Native Hawaiian entity that we're raising, that will negotiate with the federal government one day perhaps that's where we should start perhaps we should just back off a little bit and if there's any expansion to be done that affects cultural dynamics not to mention economic dynamics perhaps we should look at it that way I'm all about Native Hawaiian prosperity and if this can help bring Native Hawaiian prosperity then you got my attention but if, if, if it's simply expansionist policy now you're talking to a policy maker eh? expansion yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm not sure whether that's the best way to go. And I do know that one of uh, uh, my federal colleagues is also behind this and helping to uh, push it forward. Mm -hmm. There's an up and coming conference that's going to be here in Hawaii that is a deadline, if you will, for a presidential action. So we're here in the midst of an interesting 
area where decisions have to be made. Yeah. My next question is, once you've taken it away, when do you give it back? How do we as Native Hawaiians get in there, or not only Native Hawaiians, look at the fishing industry as an example. They're coming out strong against this, right? And it's for the economic reasons. We're coming, uh, if some of us are against it, it's simply because there's too many questions unanswered, culturally as well as economically. Well, for the, when, when the um, monument was first um, established, uh, it seems like um, constitutional pass rights might have been set aside. Is that correct, Peter? Well, and no, it's not exactly. Well, they're set aside in that, in, in that you have to have a permit now uh, you know, to go there. But, but let, let me give another uh, a, a perspective. There is already an existing monument that was put into place by George Bush in 2006. The existing monument pretty much takes care of all the concerns that were originally raised to justify monument status. It's a coastal fishery. It protected everything that needed. So the question is, in this expansion, going from 180,000 square miles to 580,000 square miles, how do you justify that kind of expansion? Now, now you're leaving the coastal zone. You're leaving all those endangered areas of, of uh, reef systems and uh, birds and, and animal life. And you're moving into, into the benthic seas where only pelagic action happens, you know, fish and that travel all over the world. So that's one. The existing monument apparently is working fine. So, so justifying the expansion is really, is, is really something that, that I cannot see. And then to have it done simply with the stroke of a president's pen without really much public vetting. Now, I know they're going to have a couple of public hearings, but uh, maybe three public hearings on an issue that is this important. It seems to me kind of insulting, I think, to the people of Hawaii. You know, so it, it's, it's very, very problematic, and it really bothers me a lot. Um, OHA had taken a vote on this issue, and they decided to support the expansion. Why did that happen? I am... <laughs> <laughs> Why? Uh, yeah, that's my question. There were, I'm, I am a dissenting uh, trustee. There were two of us who, who did not uh, support the expansion. Mm -hmm. uh, because, as uh, the senator uh, pointed out, you know, we're in, 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 in the midst of... We just came up with a constitution, you know, recently uh, through a, a, a process called an AHA, a gathering of Hawaiians. And at some point, I fully expect that we will be engaging the federal government in some kind of a government-government uh, negotiation relationship. Not that much different than Native American Indians have, have been able to take. So one of the things that would be on the table is submerged lands. Mm. So all this expansion area has to do with submerged lands, and it'll have to do with, with uh, you know, with rights, but uh, and for Hawaiians to support just surrendering 580,000 square miles of submerged lands mm -hmm. without a whimper is just—I don't get it. You know, for, oh, hold, I'm sorry. Hold that thought. We're going to take a little break, mm -hmm. um, and we'll be right back with Think Tech. Hi, my name is Aaron Wills. You are watching ThinkTechHawaii.com. I am the host of the show Rehabilitation coming soon. You can watch us live at thinktechhawaii.com at 11 a.m. on Tuesdays. I will see you there. Aloha. I'm Kaui Lucas, host of Hawaii is My Mainland every Friday here on Think Tech Hawaii. I also have a blog of the same name at kauilucas.com where you can see all of my past shows. Join me this Friday and every Friday at 3 p.m. Aloha. Aloha. My name is Josh Green. I serve a senator from the Big Island on the Kona side, and I'm also an emergency room physician. My program here on ThinkTech is called Healthcare in Hawaii. I'll have guests that should be interesting to you twice a month. We'll talk about issues that range from mental health care to drug addiction to our health care system and any challenges that we face here in Hawaii. We hope you'll join us. Again, thanks for supporting ThinkTech. Welcome back to ThinkTech. I'm Dean Sensui, uh, sitting in for Jay Fidel. Um, we're talking about the Papahanao Mokuakea Monument, and the, today's show is Fishing for Good Policy. Um, we have guests Peter Opo, Makani Christensen, Senator Galateria. Uh, Senator, um, you had something to say about um, uh, OHA's support of this expansion. Uh, well, yeah, OHA is a quasi autonomous state agency, which means that uh, some of their funding comes through the state pipeline. So that allows us to ask questions. 
about why they would support something like this. Because uh, it comes down to the uh, support of the Native Hawaiian beneficiaries. So how does supporting an expansion of this nature support the Native Hawaiian uh, uh, dynamics and policies that they are uh, in, in statute supposed to be doing? And uh, I know that they're, they've moved towards becoming a co-manager. co-manager, Peter? Is it uh, the position is to be a co-manager of the... The proposal on the table now is for co-trustee, co they okay. call it. Co-trustee. But even that, the co-trustee doesn't make the rules no. if we're looking at the, the policy of it, too. The rules are made up on the federal level. So, therefore, we do not have say on how this thing is going to be run. Because that's what Governor Ariyoshi pointed out at the rally, yeah. that if we give this up and capitulate, then there's no guarantee that anybody will have access to it because Correct. the state... The president is only required to, uh, to state a purpose for monument designation. He is not required to get into any of what are the rules, what happens, who can, you know, who's entitled, who's not entitled. All of that comes after the designation. And who would do that? I think it's I, on the federal level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. all on the federal level. Yeah, it's yeah. all on it's the all federal, federal level. So yeah. the state level... The home rule level has no say in this, uh, except, of course, perhaps through OHA and the state of Hawaii are, would be co-trustees, which means that, uh, if anything, they would be able to recommend things to the rule. I see. Yeah. That's the troubling nature of it, if there is a, in terms of policy making, because once you've, you know, let it go, again, how do we get it back? I mean, I can understand, I can really understand our colleagues, uh, who are proponents of this saying, we have to give time for the, I guess, the fishing to propagate and to grow and that sort of thing. But um, I'm looking at it from the policy level, it's not making sense to me right now. Yeah. Oh, Makani, uh, you know, they're talking about um, the fish coming back and, and reproducing and, 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 you know, increasing with this closure. You, you did a study on a core, um, a, a core study with uh, Westpac Right, we, we did. We did a study basically in Mauna Loa Bay, which was a target area for closure through the humpback whale sanctuary. And we did a study basically taking a fishing koa, a hot spot where you'd go out and you'd catch fish. And basically we watched fish grow for about a year and a half and we, we got it to the point where when we started it, it was the bloom from El Nino. So there's a massive massive bloom throughout the entire state and we got lucky enough to catch it at its infancy and we basically watched fish grow within a year time period from um, a small size to basically harvestable size um, within a year and a half you know they're about pound pound and a half I mean really um, good size to consume and take home and eat so and you know each time we went out, we probably saw about 5,000 fish, 6,000 fish, sometimes 10,000 fish, all on one core. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, we came up with the concept of it was to bridge that gap between science and the fishermen who are out there who practice science almost on a daily basis. So that's a, that was the study. Now, with that kind of um, a study, with that kind of fish and that kind of habitat, does that apply to... Big eye tuna? Um, it's two different types of fish. So you got pelagic and reef fish. So as far as big eye tuna, from what I understand from the research that's been done, you know, within two years, you know, you got 130 pound fish, 140 pound fish, depends how much food they have and how much they eat. So they grow fast and at the same time, you know, you want to make sure you catch a good sized fish for, for market. So. Two different types of fish, but you have similarities between growth process. But the, but it's not like um, not like a core where they're in a fixed position. No, they'll fixed they, they'll be tuna move. tuna move tuna move throughout the Pacific. They'll follow the currents. They'll follow um, uh, the temperatures. So, and they'll kind of gather the, uh, at upwelling spots and they'll follow the bait. Right, bait will follow the um, basically the plankton and all the small little 
critters out there, and big weed that, and the big fish will fall. And that's, well. and that's determined by um, Upwe that. upwelling, currents, temperature, you know, all those things come into factor. So that's why fishermen will follow the fish throughout the Pacific. And good fishermen have their certain spots that they go to all the time. Other fishermen, they're searching because the fish swam and they have to find them. Oh, by the way, um, just so that everybody knows, uh, wanna get Makani to talk about his qualifications. How do you know this stuff? You, you studied it at... Uh... Oh, so I, I went to the uh, United States Naval Academy, studied oceanography while I was there, and I came home and basically got taken under the wing of a very, very good fisherman. And he taught me things that I would have never known. In fact, most of the, a lot of the reasons why you see me up at legislation fighting bills is because what I see versus what is actually um, on the table proposed as legislation doesn't make sense. And a lot of it comes from years of observation and being fortunate enough to learn uh, about the fish, fish movement, fish habits. So that's what I bring to the table. Do you have any idea how much fish comes through the auction on a daily basis? Uh, you know, it could vary. Yeah. I mean, some days, what, 30,000 pound, uh, pounds to 150,000 pounds. Uh, it varies on how many boats are in um, during that time. Sometimes there's only one boat, sometimes there's five, sometimes there's none, so it all depends. Oh, so, uh, Senator, oh, I'm sorry, Peter, you had something. I was going to say, speaking of doesn't make sense, two things that really stand out. Uh, I'm assuming that the existing rules with the existing monument, you know, is going to be applied to the expansion monument. And so one of the existing rules is on the question of native rights is it allows Hawaiians to quote subsistence fish. Mm -hmm. But you have to eat the fish before you go home. Hello. Gonna have to do a lot of eating real fast. Uh, then, right? I, I would think so. <laughs> then then the other the other thing with the uh, and this has to do with the ex expansion itself. What we're saying to US fishermen, because the, the no the no take zone would go all the way out to the the furthest limits, the two hundred mile limit of, of US jurisdiction. You're saying to a U.S. fisherman that you can fish, but not in your country. That's, that's, that's the exclusive economic zone, exactly. right? That's, what's, that's, that's what where you're supposed fishermen. to fish, is yeah. <laughs> All right. Now, and, and then, and then, and then uh, uh, you know, well, anyway. <laughs> Fartless. <laughs> <laughs> if arguments can be made that uh, there could be a balance, you know, between what is being asked what is currently there, and it also, I'll go back to, if it's a Native Hawaiian issue, then let's look at Native Hawaiian prosperity as it, as it works with fishermen like Makani. Can, can, can something that is taken from the expanded zone go back to help the Native Hawaiians in Hawaii then, as part of a reconciliation process, if you will? Because if this is an expansion, that it's essentially a grab. Yeah. I mean, let's call a spade a yeah. spade. Can, can, there, can there be a balance? I mean, it seems like they're so polarized that nobody's meeting anybody in the middle. Uh, well, I, I think talking is required. There you know. does have to be some polarization, you know, and, and uh, I just remembered what, what I want to say. You know, Hawaii uh, imports 90% of our food, okay? So we have a real food security issue. Most of the 10% of food that is produced here comes from fish, fresh fish that we get from our fishermen. And a large part of that comes from the longline fisheries, which fish out in you know, the, 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 the pelagic zone. Fish move, fish work in schools, they're like buffalo. So to say to a fisherman that you cannot go where the fish go, again, it's, it doesn't make any sense. Somebody, any sense. somebody told me that, that ahi is like the Hawaiian equivalent of the buffalo. Right? They, they depended on that for a lot of their food. And um, to shut that down or to curtail it is almost like the same strategy of what you know, was done to the yes. Native Americans with their buffalo. Yeah, you but separate but from did you want to add food. something, Makani? You know, uh, my, the biggest thing is you know, this, this comes down to a, a legacy project that benefits a couple guys. And really not thinking about the people of Hawaii. And when it, you forget about the people of Hawaii. We're already struggling. It's already hard enough to have three jobs just to pay rent. I mean, you know that the cost of living is just extreme. And for the federal government to come in at this time when we've all witnessed 
failure after failure after failure in Hawaii. Why are they doing this? And why would they make it harder for us to feed our families in Hawaii? Why would they threaten jobs if a policy doesn't make sense? So that's what I wanted to add to that. Okay, we have a few minutes left. Um, Peter. I want to talk about the ticking clock. <clears throat> There's a backstory to all this. On September 10th, uh, Hawaii is going to play host to the World Conservation mm -hmm. Co Congress. Right. And part of this really it seems like a clandestine, well, I don't know, maybe that's too strong a word, on the part of the Obama administration to help establish a legacy for the president, uh, as George Bush did for himself when he declared the first monument. Uh, so uh, OHA, in fact, had, had uh, uh, gifted the Co World Conservation Congress a half a million dollars for them to come here. I mean, we were one of the donors, there were, there were others. But the ticking clock is, uh, I, 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 I think I can say that, that I am correct in saying that this monument scheme has been building for quite a few months without any input locally. At least we trustees did not know about it until recently. And it was to time the announcement of this expanded monument, which would make it the largest marine conservation area in the world I know it takes to them. time it to the September 10th convening to give the president one an excuse to come to Hawaii to make the announcement thereby establishing his legacy uh, now I say it's a backstory and uh, I you know people can deny <laughs> it but boy it sure looks like that's what's happening because it's on a fast track senator he's just made it the front story <laughs> there you go. but I, I would I would say that um, I, I won't use clandestine, I won't use <laughs> scheme. I will say that this is a unique opportunity for the conservation world to see what Native Hawaiians do for conservation. And expanding in this way might not be what Native Hawaiians do. I cannot say, because I'm not a practicing fisherman, uh, nor am I an, an ancient. I mean, I'm a contemporary Hawaiian. But I do know that from a policy perspective, we need to ask more questions. Therefore, I think we should pull back a little bit and even it, it will be a legacy for the president if we can make it work mm. and we can get the right answers. Okay, Makani, you have a lesson in there. Uh, you know, it's, let's just fishing for good policy. Let's make sure that all policy that comes out there is supported with facts and the facts support any kind of laws that come out because it affects people. It affects all people. Um, and we are all living on an island together and we need to understand the different facets of feeding people. Well, um, that sounds really good. Uh, I think we're about done here. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, for, thank you, uh, yeah, thank you Peter and Makani and, and Senator thank for you. coming out. And um, i just like to say that uh, uh, this, um, this issue is something that's worth discussing. But thank you for coming and, and watching Think Tech. My name is Dean Sensui and we're clear. <laughs> thank you.